Welcome back, friends. Today we are reading A Haunted House by Virginia Woolf. Whatever hour you woke, there was a door shutting. From room to room they went, hand in hand, lifting here, opening there, making sure a ghostly couple. Here we left it, she said, and he added, oh, but here too. It's upstairs, she murmured, and in the garden, he whispered. Quietly, they said, or we shall wake them. But it wasn't that you woke us, oh no. They're looking for it, they're drawing the curtain, one might say, and so read on a page or two. Now they've found it, one would be certain, stopping the pencil on the margin. And then, tired of reading, one might rise and see for oneself the house all empty, the doors standing open, only the wood pigeons bubbling with content and the hum of the threshing machine sounding from the farm. What did I come in here for? What did I want to find? My hands were empty. Perhaps it's upstairs, then. The apples were in the loft. And so, down again, the garden still as ever, only the book had slipped into the grass. But they had found it in the drawing room. Not that one could ever see them. The window panes reflected apples, reflected roses. All the leaves were green in the glass. If they moved in the drawing room, the apple only turned its yellow side. Yet the moment after, if the doors opened, spread about the floor, hung upon the walls, pendant from the ceiling, what? My hands were empty. The shadow of a thrush crossed the carpet. From the deepest wells of silence, the wood pigeon drew its bubble of sound. Safe, 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 the pulse of the house beat softly. The treasure buried the room. The pulse stopped short. Oh, was that the buried treasure? A moment later the light had faded. Out in the garden, then. But the trees spun darkness for a wandering beam of sun. So fine, so rare, coolly sunk beneath the surface, the beam I sought always burnt behind the glass. Death was the glass. Death was between us. Coming to the woman first, hundreds of years ago. Leaving the house, sealing all the windows. The rooms were darkened. He left it. Left her. Went north, went east. Saw the stars turned in the southern sky. Sought the house. Found it dropped beneath the downs. Safe, 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 the pulse of the house beat gladly. The treasure yours. The wind roars up the avenue. Trees stoop and bend this way and that. Moonbeams splash and spill wildly in the rain, but the beam of the lamp falls straight from the window. The candle burns stiff and still. Wandering through the house, opening the windows, whispering not to wake us. The ghostly couple seek their joy. Here we slept, she says, and he adds, kisses without number. Waking in the morning, silver between the trees, upstairs, in the garden, when summer came. In winter snow time. The doors go shutting far in the distance, gently knocking like the pulse of a heart. Nearer they come, cease at the doorway. The wind falls, the rain slides silver down the glass. Our eyes darken. We hear no steps beside us. We see no lady spread her ghostly cloak. His hands shield the lantern. Look, he breathes, sound asleep, 
love upon their lips. Stooping, holding their silver lamp above us, long they look, and deeply. Long they pause. The wind drives straightly, the flame stoops slightly. Wild beams of moonlight cross both floor and wall, and meeting, stain the faces bent, the faces pondering, the faces that search the sleepers and seek their hidden joy. Safe, 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 the heart of the house beats proudly. Long years, he sighs. Again you found me. Here, she murmurs, sleeping in the garden, reading, laughing, rolling apples in the loft. Here we left our treasure. Stooping, their light lifts the lids upon my eyes. Safe, 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 the pulse of the house beats wildly. Waking, I cry, Oh, is this your buried treasure, the light in the heart? The end. So this is kind of a funny one because it's a ghost story that's not really a ghost story. It's called The Haunted House and there are ghosts in it, but it isn't like creepy. Like you would usually find a haunted house story is like very creepy. Like it starts off a little bit like right when you wake up, but right when you wake up, it's light out and the birds are singing and stuff. So that's not, it's not the ambiance that you usually associate with horror stories, you know? Virginia Woolf is probably best known stylistically for kind of pioneering uh, stream of consciousness as kind of like a narrative uh, device. Uh, she wrote a lot of autobiographical and semi-autobiographical pieces, um, namely Room of One's Own, is one, I think I actually have a copy. Yeah, it's a, I have a copy right on over there. It focuses a lot on both feminist and class issues, neither of which are strictly relevant to a haunted house that, that we just read. I'm allowed to geek out now and then, it's okay. A Haunted House was published by Virginia Woolf initially in 1921. Apparently she just kind of wrote short stories as like a break. The same way that I play The Long Dark constantly. Uh, she just wrote short stories instead and published a bunch of them. And then she kind of decided before she passed away, she was kind of compiling them for a anthology or something. This was again published after her death. It's a lot shorter than most of the stories that we read on this channel. But I feel like we can kind of make up for it with analysis because it says a lot. There's a lot of poetic device in it that's very interesting to explore. A lot of people have called Virginia Woolf the master of the unsaid. And a lot of this is kind of reading between the lines. The narrator is a character in the story and it's kind of like a first person story, but it's not quite a first person story. It almost reads like a third person limited kind of thing, but it's decidedly first person. You don't realize until the very end that she actually has somebody else living with her, which is interesting because she talks about, you know, all all the different kinds of birds and the apples. And of course, and apples, when you're in the Western canon, always refer somewhat back to biblical things and just the general metaphor of fruit and, you know things I can't talk about because YouTube is going to demonetize me. We used to call it doing our taxes when I was in college because it's very adult. The general gist of the story is that there was this couple and the woman fell sick and died and they were living in this house and then the husband left and go found all went and found all these fun adventures just off somewhere and then eventually he came back and found the ghost of the wife there and then he died. I don't think she offed him or anything. I think he just happened to die and now they're haunting this house and the narrator is just experiencing the haunting of this house. The repetition of safe, safe, safe as you know the heartbeat of the house is kind of an interesting choice because, you know, you think of the home as being your safe place and 
you don't think of a haunted house as being a safe place, but it seems like both the narrator and the two characters that are the main characters of the book kind of have found safety, even though half of them are dead and the other half of them are living in a haunted house. This is still a safe, cozy, comfortable place for them, which is very interesting and kind of subverts a lot of the... In fact, the whole story just very much subverts a lot of the horror story genre tropes that we see a lot of the time. And we enumerated those very quickly in the story that we did, I think it was last week, maybe it was the week before, um, Edith Wharton's Afterward, we enumerated all of those. Pretty much all of them are present but twisted in this story. Oddly enough, again, the only thing that wasn't really present in this one was the spooky prophecy. But just about everything else was either present or explicitly not present in the case of, you know, the spooky atmosphere. And that the house is central in both gothic fiction and in this story, but here the house is cozy and fun and nice and bright and full of pigeons and farm equipment and junk. And as another example, she explicitly says that they do not see the ghosts. They just kind of experience the supernatural phenomena, but they explicitly do not see them, which is a twist on the gothic trope. Usually in gothic horror, it's very explicit that people are seeing visions and spirits and paranormal activity and things like that. But they're Though they are experiencing the paranormal activity, they're not seeing anything. And aside from the feeling of love, there is no real overwrought emotion here. And even if you assume that one of the two living partners is a, a woman, even the, de the dead woman is not that stressed out about the whole situation. She's just, oh, where do we leave it? I don't know. Ah. And it turns out to be love. And oh, love is not really usually the moral of the story in gothic horror. Like, especially Victorian horror definitely has a moral usually, but it's not usually just like, oh, home is where the heart is. We love each other. That's great. It's usually don't try and smooch that mysterious gentleman because he might stab you or something. So I hope you enjoyed both the story and the analysis, and I hope that I will see you next week. Bye.